Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Ms. Koken. We're back in Chapter 3, Describing Relationships. This time we're taking a look at Section 3.2, discussing the least squares regression line. By the end of this section, we want to make sure that we can interpret both the slope and the y-intercept of a least squares regression line. We're going to also call it our prediction line. We want to be able to use the least squares regression line to predict a y-value or a response value for a given x or explanatory value. We want to be able to calculate and interpret residuals and the standard deviation of the residuals for any specific problem in context. We want to be able to explain the concept of least squares and how we use this idea of least squares to come up with our least squares regression line for our, to be our prediction line. We want to be able to determine the equation of a least squares regression line using a variety of methods, meaning using summary statistics and using data with our graphing calculator. We want to be able to construct and interpret residual plots so that we can determine whether a linear model is an appropriate model to use for any particular data set. We want to assess how well the least squares regression line models the relationship between two variables and then we want to be able to describe how slope, y-intercept, standard deviation of the residuals, and r-squared are all influenced by outliers. We talked about how r or correlation coefficient would be influenced by an outlier but now we're going to go a little bit further. So let's get started. In the last section, we talked about scatter plots and how scatter plots allow us to see what the relationship looks like between an explanatory variable and a response variable, and how we measure the association between the two variables using R or the correlation coefficient. We're wanting to go a little bit further than that now, and we want to be able to come up with a model, meaning an equation or a function, that will allow us to predict the value of the response variable for any particular value of the explanatory variable. So you can see in this example we have price and dollars that we want to be able to predict using the number of miles driven. And so we can see the points uh, without the line are relatively closely associated. There's a linear relationship and it goes in the negative direction. The model, you can see that the model or the line doesn't actually go through any of the points. There's one that it comes very very close and two more that it comes pretty close. But the points are not on the line, but the line is in the middle of all the points. So the regression line is just a model for the data. We're going to be able to use it for, again, prediction purposes. So sometimes we're going to call it our prediction line, sometimes we'll call it the least squares regression line. Least squares regression line refers to the way in which the line is calculated. Now, the form that we're going to use is a little bit different than what you've seen in your algebra classes. We're going to indicate that it's a prediction line by putting that little symbol above the Y. So that's called a hat. So we're going to say y hat equals, and then the form is going to be a, the y-intercept, plus bx. b is our slope, and then x, of course, is our explanatory, the value of our explanatory variable. So you may want to take notes uh, from this slide. I'm going to continue on, but pause it if you need to so you can take notes. Let's take a look at how to interpret slope and y-intercept. This is referring to a problem listed on page 165 about the value of a truck as the uh, response variable based on the number of miles driven as the explanatory variable. So we see price hat is equal to 3,257 minus 0.0. 1629 times the miles driven. So we want to identify the slope and the y-intercept of the regression line and then interpret each value in context. Well, the y-intercept is the number that is not multiplied to the x. And so that's the 38,257. And that can be interpreted in this case as the price that a vehicle would have when zero miles are driven. And it kind of makes sense. The slope is 0.1629 because that's always the coefficient of the explanatory variable and the way that we would interpret the slope is we would say that the predicted price is going to decrease by 0.1629 for each additional mile driven. 
Now, that's not the only way you can verbalize those. So I want you to be able to see the example. You can pause it here and read through the solution so that you can hear the way that I said it and also read the way that the, the slideshow shows it. Taking a look at another example and this example is on page 166. It's a continuation of what we were just looking at. We can also use the regression line to predict, again, a response value for a particular value of the explanatory variable. How would we do that? We would basically plug it in. Now you can see here that what has happened is for 100,000 miles driven, we traced up to the least squares regression line and then traced to the vertical axis to come up with the value that's going to be predicted. The other thing that we could do is we could plug into the equation. For miles driven we would plug in 100,000 and come up with a predicted price of $21,967. That's a little bit more accurate than reading it off of the graph, but we can read it off of the graph as well. Okay, now when we use the prediction line to make a prediction, we have to be very cautious because we don't ever want to do extrapolation. We don't ever want to extrapolate. And what does that mean? That means when we look at any particular relationship between two quantitative variables with regard to explanatory and response relationship, we look at them on a scatter plot, we calculate the least squares regression line, we calculate the correlation coefficient. One of the things that we don't want to do is predict outside of the values for which that model was created. So we know that a model is created using a specific data set. Imagine if we tried to predict the height of a 10 year old child using the growth pattern from birth to one year old. We know that that wouldn't make sense because kids don't continue to go, grow at the same rate once they're beyond one year old, certainly not at the age of 10, at the same rate that they grow when they're from zero months to 12 months old. So that's extrapolation and we don't do that. Okay, let's talk about what residuals are. Residuals are kind of that idea of a leftover. When you make a prediction using the prediction line, you have the observed value for the particular value of x and then you have the predicted value. When we subtract observed value of the response variable minus the predicted variable uh, value of the response variable. That subtraction results in the residual. If you take a look at the scatter plot right here, again, same one that we were looking at a little while ago, you can see that the vertical distance is the difference between the predicted or the actual value and the predicted value. What's going to end up happening is when we have points that are above the prediction line, we're going to see that we have a positive residual value. When we have a point, an observed point, what actually happened below the prediction line, then we're going to have a negative residual. And again, we come up with the predictions just by plugging in an x value into our regression line equation. So y minus y hat is what the residual is calculated with. Okay, what's a, G, a least squares regression line? We have lots of different ways of calculating a prediction line, but what our calculator uses and what we're going to be doing is using the least squares scheme to come up with the regression line. And what this does is if you imagine every single possible line that we could draw between miles driven and price. What we want to do is find each of the residuals, square the value of the residual, add all of those squares together, so the sum of the squared residuals ends up being a specific number. We want to pick the line that will minimize the sum of the squared residuals. So thereby, that's our way of getting it in the middle of all the points as close to as close as possible to all of the points, but knowing that it doesn't matter if we even go through any of the points. We just want to minimize the squared differences or the squared residuals. So that's what least squares mean. There's another type of graph that we're going to be taking a look at 
as as we're going through this process of looking at bivariate data and that's called a residual plot and it's kind of what you imagine it to be we're going to take all of the residuals that we found a minute ago by doing y minus y hat subtraction and we're going to graph those on a new kind of graph called the residual plot the x axis or the explanatory axis is going to be the same on the scatter plot as it is for the residual plot so we're going to use the same axis that we use for the scatter plot on the residual plot but in the vertical direction instead of plotting either the observed point or the predicted point we're going to plot the observed minus predicted or the residual and where our scatter plot started out looking like this our residual plot is going to have a horizontal line at zero we're going to have some points above that horizontal line meaning the observed is greater than the predicted and we're going to have some points below meaning the observed is less than the predicted value and the prediction line is kind of represented at that zero line where there's no difference between an observed value and a predicted value so this is what a residual plot looks like now we want to be able to see no pattern and when we see no pattern in a residual plot, we know that a linear model is appropriate for our data. You can clearly see a pattern, a curved pattern, in this residual plot. And I would say to you, that's your indicator to know that it's not appropriate for us to use a linear model to approximate this data. Now one of the things that we're interested in with our residuals is the standard deviation of the residuals, the standard deviation of all of the y minus y hat values. Now don't get confused, sometimes students think of correlation coefficient r as the residual. It's not the same thing. The r, remember, has no units and it was the z-score of the exit point, the z-score of the y-coordinate, and uh, multiplied to each other, added all together, and then divided by n minus 1, or the number of values minus 1 that we have in our data set. That's the correlation coefficient. The residual is just the y minus y hat, two different things. So when we're looking at the standard deviation of the residuals, what we're really looking at is how off is our line, is our prediction line, typically from each of the individual data points. That's what the standard deviation is referring to. We want to be able to interpret this in context. And the way that it's calculated is using this formula, but this shouldn't be any big surprise. And, and what we're going to be doing for the most part is using this as a given value. Most of the time we're not going to be asked to calculate this, but this is just how you would calculate it if you were going to. Okay, let's talk a little bit about something a little, a little, uh, can be a little bit confusing for students. We call it the coefficient of determination, and this basically is our r squared value. The coefficient of determination is the fraction or the percent or the proportion of the variation that we see in the values of y that is purely because we're using a least squares regression line. Okay, so this r squared value is basically one way that we can determine how well the least squares regression line is going to predict the response variable for us. And you can calculate it a few different ways. You can see this formula. Another way that we're going to calculate it though is just by squaring the value of r. And literally that means that r squared is the square of r, the correlation coefficient. We're going to be taking a look at an example, but uh, we're going to actually stop here and pick up on a part two of section 3.2, where we can go through this example in detail and then go over a couple of other concepts. So I'll see you back on the next video.